Remember growing up, being in class, and the teacher looked out into the classroom and asked for a volunteer, and you're like, I don't want to go until someone kind of nudges you. And then you look at them, and you realize, all right, I guess it's my turn. Well, that's how I feel with you all right now. I didn't seek this out, but I'm here today sharing my story on behalf of all of those who cannot. I'm honored to be speaking at a patient engagement roundtable, surrounded by people who can actually affect change to the policies that will improve the lives of so many. But I have to say, in reading the panel description before this meeting, there was one term that stood out to me, and it was the term return on investment. And I share that because I get it. Things have to make sense. But to reduce human lives to a return on a business investment didn't sit so well with me. So I want to challenge this room to something today. Consider the 10-year-old boy who passed away from a rare pediatric cancer just last week. If we're talking about the return on investment of human life, why have we deprioritized pediatric cancer? Consider the 70 plus years of life that was just lost. Imagine if we thought a little differently about those 70 years of life lost. Imagine if we created a new benchmark for determining return on investment. Instead of allotting resources based on the number of people affected, we could use the new metric of cumulative years of life lost. My story is the story of a standard of care that has remained unchanged for 40 years. Perhaps as a byproduct of the miscalculation of ROI. So my story begins in October 2020, a year and a half ago, when the pandemic had just hit its stride. We were all avoiding medical facilities like the plague, literally. And it was also during this time when a suspicious, palpable, but otherwise asymptomatic lump appeared in my body. After three attempts in eight weeks of being successively dismissed by doctors, because I'm young and otherwise healthy presenting, my world shattered on October 28th, 2020. That was the day I was diagnosed with stage four alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, an extremely rare, vicious pediatric soft tissue sarcoma that impacts 300 people each year, most of whom are under the age of eight, which was 16 years younger than my tender age of diagnosis, about 24. At 24, cancer as I knew it was an astrological sign. I was even a division one athlete, always heads down into whatever I was obsessed with on a given day. So at 19, it was all about volleyball, health and nutrition. At 21, it was about solo traveling the world while finishing my degree. And at 23, it was about establishing myself as a young professional in New York City and landing a job at my dream company, Google. And at Google, you know how we love our data. <laughs> but instead of focusing on the data sets today, which are, of course, patients in this context, I actually want to focus on the framework and algorithms in which we interpret that data. Because the bottom line is patient engagement is not unilateral. I sit before you in a patient engagement roundtable, and I have to share the good, the bad, and the hideous. So from the beginning, it was very clear that I was up against a formidable foe. Stage four rhabdo comes with a 5% chance of five-year survival upon recurrence. But it's the golden age of cancer treatment. How could that be? It's simple. Because of its rarity, pediatric cancer is neglected. The federal government apportions just 4% of its annual budget towards research on pediatric cancer. And you wonder why the outcomes haven't improved in 40 years. In my particular case, with aggressive biomarkers that happened to make a bad situation even worse, if that was possible, I knew that there was an 80% chance that my cancer would return even after enduring the grueling 10 and a half months of chemotherapy and 33 days of radiation that the standard of care deemed I had to endure. My cancer returned five weeks after finishing those 10 and a half months of treatment. Knowing that the standard of care is the best option a specialist can give for a given diagnosis, it was abundantly clear from the beginning that the current system and treatments were not going to save me. So I have to do everything in my power to save myself. Led by the fierce efforts of my mom, this meant hitting the ground running to find alternatives. Early on, even in my 10 and a half months of treatment, it was clear that a, an immunotherapy approach, as opposed to more of the toxic chemotherapies, would be key in providing a durable response. We were fortunate enough to cross paths with a gentleman named Brad Power who decided his retirement years would be filled with the purpose 
of hosting medical hackathons, wherein one, for one hour a week over Zoom, <laughs> one hour a week over Zoom, for three months, a group of diverse, dynamic, and engaged clinicians, researchers, bioinformaticians, and industry participants would come together free of charge, might I add, with the objective of hacking my disease, both from a clinical and data standpoint. My expert hackathon panel validated the next best option to be a personalized immunotherapy approach with the neoantigen vaccine. We came to this conclusion in part due to the knowledge, the anecdotal knowledge of two patients with my disease or current disease who'd received a, a similar treatment 10 years prior and supposedly had remarkable results. But neither my family nor my treatment team could locate an article on the treatment itself, so we feared that we hit a dead end. After six months of sleuthing, we located that article and the findings were astounding. An 83% response rate from patients exactly like me. We were shocked that not only had the study ceased, but its findings weren't more readily shared with the public. On one hand, it was a validation of our efforts. And on the other hand, it was disheartening that such important information could just be tossed aside. I'm happy to report that in five days, the Mayo Clinic will be administering my first dose of an eight month awaited neoantigen vaccine. With this vaccine treatment though, there's a catch. Its greatest potential is with as little tumor burden as possible. Since my cancer has successively recurred since finishing those 10 and a half months of treatment, that means in between starting the vaccine trial and beginning, actually beginning it, I've had to endure bridge therapies. So just last week, I finished 15 days of radiation to my chest, back, and pelvic region. Cumulatively, <laughs> that marks my 48th dose of radiation in the last year. I've also endured seven different chemotherapies, two and almost three clinical trials, and multiple surgeries to control my disease. It's been a relentless journey, as you can imagine, but not all doom and gloom. Fed up with the lack of support from the government, Last fall, we decided to take matters into our own hands and establish the Casey Allman Research Fund through Rain and Sarcoma, which is a 501c3 dedicated towards improving the lives of those affected by sarcoma. The fund has one objective, and it's to put 100% of the funds towards research on improving the outcomes for those affected by alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. I'm really proud to share that we've raised $550,000 in the last six months and with that money, just that money, we've been able to, to fund three different research proposals, including a clinical trial through the Mayo Clinic with at least three rhabdomyosarcoma patients, and they will each receive their own neoantigen vaccine. And I will be their proof of concept case, so no pressure immune system, do your thing. <laughs> it is not lost on me what a luxury it is, not only to feel well, but to not have competing priorities in between treatment, side effects, and hospitalizations to be speaking with you all today. But I also feel the gravity, the weight, to represent those who are too young to speak and those who are no longer with us. That's why we have to imagine a more patient-empowered system with cooperation from the medical complex to insurance providers and we still have our work cut out, as we all know. That's why we're here. Just last month, in pursuit of the next best treatment, a drug designed to prime my immune system ahead of this trial, insurance denied my claim. The amount billed to insurance once overhead was added, $41,000 for a single dose. This is yet again another illustration of why it's not enough to be an engaged patient. This isn't where our work stops, this is where our work begins. I, if I were to rely on the current system, candidly, I would be dead by your end. And that's just unacceptable for me. The bottom line is patients and caregivers shouldn't have to do what we've done. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I've cracked the code to my cancer, but what I will say is I dream of the day when this degree of patient engagement is no longer the necessary ingredient in extending my life. Thank you. <laughs>